So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Dirk Glesa and I'm the Director of the Sustainable Development of Tourism Department of um, the World Tourism Organization. I welcome you to our second information session today on the Glasgow Declaration. At COP25, we presented the research UNWTO together with the International Transportation Forum prepared on the tourism sector's transportation footprint. It was, it was important for us not only to update the figures for the sector, but especially to model and understand the full dimensions of international and domestic tourism in the year 2030. The research showed that the sector's transportation-related emissions which represent an estimated 75% of all tourism emissions were forecast to increase by 25% by 2030 from 2016 levels against the current ambition scenario. We therefore concluded at COP25 that there's an urgent need to increase climate action and to support a high ambition scenario of the tourism sector. Over the past month and weeks, the drafting partners have worked on the Glasgow Declaration and consulted the commitments. Today, during this information session, you will hear more about the making and the purpose of the declaration and listen to the practical insights of climate frontrunners. We wish that you can join as early as possible as signatories and help accelerate climate action in the most catalytic manner possible. Before concluding, I wish to thank all the partners involved Notably, the United Nations Environment Programme, Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency, the Travel Foundation, Visit Scotland, and everyone who participated in the development of the declaration. Having said this, I have now the pleasure to introduce my good colleague, Niklas Svenixen, the manager of the Global Climate Action Team of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, also known as UNFCCC, who will speak today, now the second time, about the way to Glasgow. Niklas, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, panelists, uh, for being with us today. Niklas, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dirk. Thank you so much for those, those words and, and words of welcome to, to all of us. Uh, it is really a pleasure for, for me to have this opportunity uh, to say a few words uh, about the Glasgow Declaration and this really important work. So my name is Niklas Svenningsen. I'm working with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It's a long name, so we just say UN Climate Change. And we are the ones in the UN system that are responsible for trying to help all the governments of the world to work together on tackling the climate crisis. I'm saying the climate crisis, not the future climate change challenge or anything, because what we have seen over the last several years, and maybe especially this year also, is not only heat records being broken all the time, but we also see very devastating and immediate effects in terms of um, uh, extreme heat waves in, in Western America, flooding in China and India, and even here in Germany, only a, a few minutes drive from Bonn here, we had several hundred people being drowned by, by flooding caused by, by climate change um, and many other extreme events and impact on ecosystems that we see. So when we are heading to COP26, the 26th climate, uh, conference of the parties of UNFCCC, in about a month from now, we are doing that with, with a lot of seriousness. Um, it is a COP that is, I would say, more important than many of other COPs have been in, in the past, uh, simply because we need to move from negotiation to implementation. Um, one of the important parts of our work are the naturally determined contributions. These are the natural action plans that every country, every part of UNFCCC need to submit. And um, we received an update of those uh, in the past years. And what those climate action plans say that while science tells us that we need to reduce global emissions by 50% in the next nine years until 2030, we are still on trajectory to increase emissions by 16% by 2030, which of course is nothing short of a complete disaster. So we need all hands on deck now. We need not only governments, we need the private sector, civil society, uh, and 
citizens like you and me to work together to help the governments to implement the Paris Agreement to keep climate change below 2.0 degrees, 2 .0 degrees, ideally below 1.5 degrees Celsius above what it used to be before industrialization took hold. So I'm talking about the private sector and civil society, and of course, tourism has an enormous role to play here. Tourism was always important for the entire sustainable development uh, agenda, the, all the SDGs, but also from the perspective of, of uh, the climate. The impact from tourism, from mass tourism, was never sustainable from any dimension. And when we are now going back to um, restarting our societies after the pandemic, I know we're still in the pandemic for, for a time, but we see efforts to restart the economies and societies and open up again. Um, the fact is that we cannot go back to business as usual. We need to have a smart tourism sector, a sustainable tourism sector, a climate neutral uh, tourism sector. So this is why UNFCCC is delighted to support the Glasgow Declaration. And when we come to COP26, we will put the spotlight on the tourism sector. And we look forward to all of you to join us and to make this declaration going from declaration to actual implementation. Thank you so much again for the opportunity to share a few words today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Greetings. And I'd just like to start out by thanking you very much, uh, Dirk and Niklas, for your welcome remarks. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending where you are. And thanks to all of your the participants for your interest in joining us today. We have many people connected to the session here in Zoom and several others streaming the session in YouTube. Um, just a quick housekeeping note, the interpretation into Spanish has been activated. So if you haven't done that already, you just need to click the interpretation button and you will be able to hear English into Spanish. My name is Jeremy Sampson and I'm the CEO of the Travel Foundation and chair of the Future of Tourism Coalition. I'm greatly honored to be the moderator of this panel discussion and to be joined by an amazing lineup of speakers who I'll be introducing one by one as it is their turn to speak. The objective of today's session is it's an information session it's, and it's for us to take one more step together in the collaborative process that we've been following to develop the Glasgow Declaration. Our aim is to now involve all of you in the road to COP26, extending the audience further than the partners who have supported us so far in developing the declaration. With support from our panelists, we will learn about the pathways and commitments proposed in the declaration to accelerate tourism's ability to transform and achieve net zero as soon as possible. You, the audience, will also be informed about how it will be possible to become a signatory to the declaration and what this will entail. Please remember that the text of the declaration is already available on the One Planet Network website, and we've just posted in the chat the link to access it for your convenience. So please take some time if you haven't already to read the full text of the declaration. As you will have noticed, all mics from the audience are off today. We're, we're a large audience and we have a lot to get through. Nevertheless, you are invited to leave your comments in the chat throughout the session. And even if we are unlikely to be able to address them live today, you can rest assured that they will be processed and they will be very useful to be integrated into a frequently asked questions document about the Glasgow Declaration, which we're preparing now and which will be made available very shortly. Please also do not hesitate to send your comments via email to our One Planet Network address if you prefer. The address, which is oneplanetstp at unwto.org has been posted in the chat as well. All right, let's get into it. Without further ado, I would now like to invite our esteemed panelists to turn on their cameras so that we can start the panel discussion. Welcome everyone. So as mentioned by Derek and Niklas, the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow in November will be a momentous occasion for our sector to align with global agreements and scientific frameworks towards a decade of concerted and effective climate action. Therefore, the Glasgow Declaration aims to urge all travel and tourism stakeholders to share a voice and make genuine commitments to climate action. This is our second session of today, and this morning we heard from guest speakers such as WTTC, the World Travel and Tourism Council, that they are indeed firmly behind this declaration. So it will now be fantastic to hear from our panelists what they think in this regard. I'd like to start with you, Shannon. 
So Shannon Guillen is the Chief Treadwright and Sustainability Officer for the Travel Corporation, a family of 40 travel brands operating worldwide. What do you think, Shannon? Are we ready as a sector to share a voice and accelerate climate action to support the global commitment to cut emissions in half by 2030? Well, it's certainly time. It's certainly absolutely critical. Uh, and the readiness factor is something that's gonna vary on an organization and a destination basis, I'm afraid. As you mentioned at the Travel Corporation, you know, 40 travel brands, almost every continent, I mean, we're relatively early in our climate action efforts a couple of years in. Um, however, you know, it's interesting because our, our work to incorporate the principles of sustainability into our business, Jeremy, as you know, are longstanding. For a number of years, we've been actively engaging our supply chain. And while we've been met with, I would say, considerable enthusiasm and anecdotal evidence of climate action from within it, it's clear, and certainly from my perspective, we need much more than anecdotes. So as an organization, respectively, we're at a stage where collaboration is necessary if we are to address the challenges such as the transition to low carbon energy and something I speak to you about regularly, transportation. These are issues that are critical to the success of our own climate ambitions at the Travel Corporation. And I fear ones that we will struggle to uh, tackle with much meaning, I'm afraid, on our own. And so just as climate change is a shared challenge, solutions will come about more quickly if we support one another's progress. Um, you know, perhaps an opportunity for real, genuine collaboration in this industry. And so my hope that the declaration will encourage, encourage that, will encourage much greater action on behalf of our sector, because most certainly it's true that working together in this particular topic, we're going to be much stronger. Thanks, Shannon. And Shannon's uh, given us a little preview of the the five pathways coming later. One of those is collaboration. And I didn't invite her to speak on that topic, but I'm glad she had the, the opportunity to speak about that today. Cause I think not only is it one of the pathways of the declaration, but an overarching theme for our um, session and, and this declaration and, and the path forward um, for us as a sector. All right, so let's hear from our next panelist. Um, I'd like to invite some thoughts from Joe. So Joe Kechlin is the CEO of Incaterra which is a pioneering tour operator focused on ecotourism and sustainable development in Peru. And he's here officially representing the municipality of Machu Picchu. Joe, in your opinion, which of the needs that you've observed in, in Latin America aiming at advancing climate action could be best supported by the declaration? Thank you. Thank you all for listening to this uh, particular topic about what, uh, what can we do in South America to lessen our carbon activity. What uh, is uh, easy to say is that uh, South America is big and uh, many of uh, our passengers uh, come to rural areas. And what are the problems in rural areas? There's the health issues. And what's the uh, health uh, issues uh, that relate to it? Let's uh, go directly to Machu Picchu. The, the purpose of this meeting, as I understand it, is that uh, we, we need to come to do some effective uh, actions, uh, which uh, will bring back a responsible recovery of tourism, meaning that the uh, community's uh, environment uh, will be positively affected. Uh, for that, uh, we need a plan. That uh, plan in uh, Peru, specifically in uh, Machu Picchu, has been uh, put into practice uh, over five years ago with uh, the municipality of Machu Picchu, with the global beverage uh, group uh, AGE, A -G -J -E, and uh, with uh, Incaterra. Incaterra has been in the area of Machu Picchu precisely 50 years now we're working there so it's uh, we are part of the environment the social environment and uh, the uh, environmental environment uh, what are we doing Machu Picchu is uh, a high mountain which uh, at its uh, foot uh, hills is the Machu Picchu Pueblo Machu Picchu Pueblo has uh, uh, it's a canyon so it has a, a lifeline which is a train and uh, many people go there over a million and a half uh, 
over a million people have, have been there on the 19th, 2019. So garbage. Garbage is uh, a visible, tangible problem there as it is uh, throughout uh, South America. Garbage is plastic. So to reduce uh, plastic, uh, not, con not the use, because uh, that's difficult yet, but uh, plastic uh, disposal, uh, with uh, AGE and uh, an agreement with the municipality, we took a, 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 a compressor plant to, to compress it so that it could uh, be taken out of uh, town and uh, eventually have uh, an economic return, which uh, pays uh, for the people who are involved in, uh, in, in, uh, in a garbage collection. Then we, since it's a canyon and a river, it's uh, the oil, the vegetable oil from uh, restaurants and hotels, so, we put a plant to make it into biodiesel. So now it's uh, less diesel coming in and uh, less uh, pollution to the river. Then we invented uh, a pyrolyzation, uh, a, a combustion plant that uh, with uh, no, no carbon emissions uh, would uh, turn organic waste uh, into biochar, and that uh, is uh, also being doing today. That uh, biochar results uh, into uh, a good uh, fertilizer that uh, concentrates and uh, better uh, soil conditions. So for that, uh, with that, uh, we are working on, with assistance, uh, with the cooperation of the government uh, taxes, they have uh, allocated uh, EMR taxes uh, for Nicatera and Aje to use into restoring biodiversity through reforestation at uh, Machu Picchu with the native plants, as uh, Nicatera has done uh, since over 40 years ago at the, its uh, site within the Machu Picchu town. And uh, then we have uh, put uh, a plant uh, to uh, dispose of, uh, of uh, glass bottles. So that uh, won't uh, go out uh, by train, emissions in included uh, and disposed on a, on a garbage uh, plant. So that, that reduces uh, the impact on the environment. What is uh, what uh, we are working on is on replicating this uh, exercise uh, throughout uh, Peru and eventually South America. It uh, involves uh, a lot of work. It's uh, difficult, but trash. Trash is a very big polluting effect of uh, tourism and human presence. So we need to address that. And uh, I don't know if I'm out of time. Uh, a, yeah, I think, I think so. <laughs> I think Joe skipped ahead a bit to the next section, which is just fine. He started giving us a preview of the decarbonization pathway. Um, I think it's a great example, though. It's really nice to just dive into concrete examples, and it really gives us an, a nice example of, of public-private collaboration, which certainly could be replicated to other areas in, in Latin America. For your second question, Joe, maybe you could have a think about the big picture around the declaration when we come back to you later, the declaration and how meaningful it might be for um, for the region that, that you work in. Um, so thank you very much, Joe. I really appreciate the um, concrete examples. Delphine, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, Dr. Delphine Mayeret King is CEO of The Long Run. Uh, the Long Run is a membership organization which supports a global network of tourism-based privately protected areas. So Delphine, from your perspective, we're going to zoom out again, big picture. Wh what do you think the declaration can contribute to accelerate progress? Well, I think maybe like Shannon, I just think uh, the declaration is a, is a way to coalesce. It's a, it's an important step for the sector to take a stance and define its commitment. I feel that the uh, that the pathways that have been defined are inclusive. I think we finally go beyond just decarbonization, and it uh, leaves the space for. Um, all the other ways in which the sector should contribute uh, and can contribute. 
such as you know encouraging regeneration protection which is particularly relevant to to the long run but also collaboration which is key at this stage for us to to accelerate change the only way we can do that is to collaborate share learning uh and 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 cross pollinate i think there's there's you know there's only one way and and uh, as it was said before is everyone's responsibility to jump in and the sector definitely has has to has <laughs> has to commit and i think the declaration is a good step towards that great thank you delphine i'm loving the theme of collaboration it's it's my favorite pathway if i had to choose one uh, i think it's the most important overarching pathway in some ways to um, achieving all, all the rest of them um, and very much what the, the spirit of the glasgow glasgow declaration is all about and um, it was also really important to the drafting committee that we we went beyond decarbonization thinking about adaptation thinking about regeneration and going back to something that i i'm sure many of us believe on this call which is um, in the in the potential of tourism to be really part of the solution. Um, so thank you very much, Delphine, for those thoughts. I'm going to turn it over to Christine for the fourth question. Christine Young has joined us today. Thank you, Christine. She, among the many hats she wears, is a board member of the Caribbean Alliance for Sustainable Tourism, which is the environmental arm of the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association. Christine, from your perspective, um, we've done. We've defined a, a clear and consistent sector-wide message and approach to climate action through the declaration. What, what kind of added value do you think that brings to our sector and particularly to your work in the Caribbean? Yes, okay. Good morning, Jeremy and everyone. And uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be here. We are privileged to be a part of this very exciting session. Uh, so in terms of the, the declaration, a small island, uh, the developing states, you know, the climate challenge is very real for us uh, with sea level rising, uh, warming sea temperatures, leading to coral bleaching, salt intrusion, uh, coastal erosion, etc. You know, it's a, it's a very real challenge for us. And we have certainly recognized how important this is to our region. Uh, most of our Caribbean hotels as well are located on the coastline. So we're particularly vulnerable to this and very, very sensitive to this issue of climate change. Uh, the tourism industry as well as a main contributor in terms of the GDP to most of the, the nation's uh, regions and to the countries. So tourism is very, very important to us. We're, so we're taking this topic very, very seriously and we're very excited to be a part of this. Um, I think that the Glasgow uh, Declaration is uh, very timely and it will certainly add value to the sector by catalyzing climate action in the region. And I like the whole idea of climate action. Uh, because it really, you know, gives gives life to it. Um, it's a very consolidated approach as well. And I love the five-step pathway um, because it offers a synergistic approach to climate uh, change and mitigation in order to change the current trajectory. Uh, of particular importance and significance to us uh, at the Caribbean Alliance for Sustainable Tourism as well is the fact that the declaration acknowledges not just the impact of climate change, but also, as you mentioned, Jeremy, the collaborative approach, um, looking at the vulnerable groups, such as the small island, uh, women and youth, for example. And it, it establishes guidelines for these groups to work together, so to collaborate uh, from a local government perspective, private sector, all of these are included, small and medium enterprises, etc. So it further includes dedicated action, not only to just uh, the declaration, but also to measuring and monitoring to documentation of climate change commitment through established policy to assure, ensure a high level of compliance with the global objectives. So we're really, uh, we really uh, like the declaration and we are in full support of it. Great. Thank you so much, Christine. And finally, last but not least, we have Erica Sears. Um, Erica Sears is the Deputy Director at the Oregon Coast Visitors Association, which is a destination management organization responsible for all 363 miles of Oregon's public coastline. She also happens to be, I'm just going to give her a plug because she's the pod, she is the host of a podcast called Big Tourism, which I had the pleasure to participate in and, and be a guest on. So I feel like I'm turning the tables and interviewing Erica back now um, and, and welcoming her to this important panel. Um, Erica, could you give us your thoughts, please? Yeah, thank you so much, Jeremy, for the plug. I'm excited to be here. Christine, so much of what you said really spoke to me and what we are experiencing as well as a small destination. So I'm, I'm excited to be able to present 
that perspective today. Um, as Jeremy mentioned, the declaration is now available for you to read, and I hope you do get the opportunity to look through that document. It's beautifully written. Uh, every line of it, I was, yes, 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 that makes sense to me. And something that really stood out is there's, there's a sentence in it that says this need to transform from this carbon and material intensive way of delivering visitor experiences to prioritizing our communities and our, in our ecosystems. And it just it is a good reminder that as a destination management organization, we're constantly redefining what it is our role is in our tourism organization and how many of us in the past year or I guess 19 months or two years of COVID-19 have had to reconsider what our role is. Um, I know on the Oregon coast, we were unable to market. We were unable to ask visitors to come here. And so um, as we've reconsidered what our role is in this changing climate, it's really opened our, eye, our eyes to how this has been affecting our dest destination, similar to examples that Christine was just sharing. Uh, some of the highest levels of ocean acidification have been recorded off of the Oregon coast here in the Pacific Ocean. Um, additionally, our seafood industries like the Dungeness crab, oysters, and commercial fishing have been affected for over 15 years due to a warming ocean. So as a destination, we already have sectors that are going to be impacted, that are impacted and are changing the visitor's experience, um, the, what they're eating when they're here, the things that they're doing. So we're, we're highly sensitive to um, our changing climate. And so I love the way Nicholas wrote, uh, said this in the beginning, to move from negotiation to implementation. And that's exactly what I was thinking when I looked at this declaration is that we're moving the questions from should the, should the tourism industry be a part of this? Should we be doing climate action to how are we doing this um, to, to reconsider and redefine what we are as, as tourism organizations and destination management organizations around the world to have conversations like this and to share resources to, to move us forward. Thank you, Erica, and thanks to the panelists for all the great reflections on the declarations. I, I just want to take a minute now to um, talk a little bit more about the story behind the declaration. Um, the driving force behind the initiative was the report that Dirk alluded to in his opening, uh, the report which projected an increase of emissions across travel and tourism by at least 25% by 2030, making it really difficult for our sector to remain in line with international uh, commitments. So just to raise some of the key points of the declaration and what signatories are committed to. Signatories are making a commitment to um, cut their emissions in half by at least half by 2030. A commitment to deliver scientifically informed climate action plans. A commitment to report publicly and transparently against targets on an annual basis. A commitment to align with the five shared pathways around which the declaration is structured. We've already alluded to them, but I'll say them again. Measure, decarbonize, regenerate, collaborate, and finance. And above all, a commitment to work in a collaborative spirit, share good practices and solutions, and disseminate information that can help our sector move forward. I wanna give you a bit of background on how this declaration came to life. An initial drafting committee consisting of UNWTO, UNEP, Tourism Declares, the Travel Foundation, and Visit Scotland came together around this shared concept and began holding regular meetings in March. We just started thinking, how might we attempt to unite the industry and ensure that we had a significant presence at COP26 for travel and tourism? We felt it was critical that we would arrive at the COP with a shared vision and a commitment for aligning our sector around a shared response to the climate emergency. In addition, the drafting committee all shared the vision for being open and collaborative, grounded in science and committed to supporting communities and vulnerable destinations in a just transition. So the idea that we needed a central guiding document was pretty clear. We took inspiration from Tourism Declares existing declaration, which has um, 320 some odd dec declarants already. Um, but we brought the conversation to a global level while maintaining that single focus on actionable commitments. We also went through two extensive rounds of consultation with industry partners all around the globe. We really wanted to sense check and further develop those initial drafts to make sure they were representative of our sector at large. Our goal has always been to trigger a real movement that will result in lasting change. So for the second round of questions, I have assigned each of our panelists one of the pathways in the declaration. And we're gonna start at the beginning with measure. 
So the first pathway is measure, and it recommends measuring and disclosing all travel and tourism related emissions. So Shannon, that's for you. What's the overall approach that you are taking at TTC to emissions measurement? And can you reflect a bit on the challenges and creative thinking that it takes to scale this effort across all of your brands? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Erica noted a moment ago that we're moving to should language rather than you know, do we. Um, and in the spirit of that, I really wanted to get into the how from our perspective, because you know you cannot effectively engage in the four final pathways of the declaration without beginning to manage or, or measure, of course. And measurement, frankly, in my opinion, is perhaps the most challenging of all pathways. That's, that's something I'm very engaged with them up, which is why Jeremy's laughing. So I'm going to get quite granular on this um, because I'm, I'm, I'm frankly, personally, a little tired of, of high level, high level rhetoric, which outside of this group we hear quite a lot of. So I want to just get into the details on what those challenges are for us. So the Travel Corporation measures emissions in line with GHG protocol. We have a very complex operation. We have Uniworld River Cruises. Red Carnation Hotels, uh, more than 40 offices and facilities, and a rather large fleet of vehicles. So we rely on a cloud-based reporting structure. Um, we did begin with Excel, as some people, organizations do, but we quickly outgrew that. So this tool, it's a QBO for anyone who's interested for tactics. Um, we've had quite a lot of success for it. This tool measures scope one, two, and select scope three emissions, including business air, travel, water, and waste. We have an internal auditing process to validate information gathered, and we begin our first uh, external audit on our 2019 baseline in a matter of weeks. This is an onerous task, but it's critical for us to ensure both accuracy and transparency. Our trips and our travel experiences represent the vast majority of our scope three emissions, and tracking these emissions required us to build a customized carbon calculator, which was deployed across all brands. It's not to suggest that everyone needs to build something custom. However, we did evaluate all of the existing tools to measure your carbon footprint and those of your products and services in travel and tourism. Unfortunately, we found none that fit our needs or model given we own quite a lot of our assets. So we had to be creative and we had to seek support and insight from others in our space. And I'm always happy to share uh, it was an organization to help us along this journey. But it's another great example, I know I'm talking about measurement, of the, the need for collaboration on this topic. So a critical first step in measuring scope three emissions is to determine boundaries. So what are we going to consider in and out of scope on our, on our um, experiences and services? To that end, we view the emissions associated with included accommodations, meals, and transfers as our responsibility to measure and handle. What the traveler does outside of our included services is out of our control. The elephant in the room, of course, is that it does not include the emissions to and from destination. Typically the most significant part of a traveler's carbon footprint. This falls within the airline's boundary and at this time is not accounted for in our scope three emissions. This is certainly why we participate in forums such as the Glasgow Declaration to advocate for the investment in sustainable aviation fuels and for all of us to take our own responsibility for our emissions. All this said, our approach to measurement continues to evolve uh, as more information becomes available as we look to continue to strengthen our measurement and reporting practices. And frankly, as more organizations enter the space, a great example is our goal is to have our trip carbon calculator, which was built by an external third party, as I noted, externally verified by an additional third party. However, we haven't been able to find the appropriate partner who's able to do this, as our sector currently lacks a shared approach to methodology, which is really important for some of those small organizations that are trying to get on board with this. So we hope, again, that with greater numbers, greater collaboration, that we can learn from and refine our approach to measurement. And finally, I'll add that while measurement is really as complex as your respective operation, it's of course imperative to understand the nature of our footprint. Without this understanding, it would be impossible for us to set the critical, critical reduction targets and report on them, which is a process that we are embarking in um, in Q4. So I hope that was the detail you were after, Jeremy. 
Thank that you. was perfect. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. I really appreciate it. We, we did assign you measurement specifically because Shannon is always the one um, calling out the need for more action and more detail over, over rhetoric. <laughs> um, and so we put her to the test. And <laughs> I really appreciate you sharing both the concrete wins and progress that you've made and, and just laying out some of the challenges. I think we'll have to be quite transparent about what those challenges are um, going forward. And maybe not everyone will be dealing with such complexity at the scale that you are, um, but the more we hear what those challenges are, the more we'll be able to identify um, what those opportunities look like to collaborate and, and to um, um, achieve, set and achieve those aggressive decarbonization targets. Um, so over to Jose now, um, sorry, Joe. Um, and Joe, you've already had a chance to share with us um, your pathway is, is decarbonized. And Joe, you've already had a chance to share with us some of the great progress that has been made in Machu Picchu towards decarbonizing tourism operations. So I'm just going to throw it back to you and ask if you have any more examples that you want to share um, that fall under this pathway, or perhaps, as I said earlier, if you want to reflect a bit more on the, the Glasgow Declaration and, and the opportunity that this is bringing to Machu Picchu and to, to Latin America. Congratulations, Jeremy, for bringing up uh... Uh, this uh, concept of uh, tourism as a means to, to create the wealth to local populations by uh, conservation actions uh, which are based on uh, research, which is uh, mainly what uh, we do. Yes, uh, metrics, as uh, just uh, mentioned, it's uh, metrics what we have to look at. Uh, and metrics uh, we have been doing since uh, 1978 uh, by doing inventories. Since uh, then, uh, we have, uh, by uh, um, Dr. E.O. Wilson, uh, the largest uh, number of ant species for a given place, uh, at our place. With the American Orchid Society, we have uh, the largest uh, number of uh, orchids uh, native orchid species in their habitat uh, within our place at Machu Picchu, within the town of Machu Picchu. The restoration of this place in Nicaterra in uh, Machu Picchu Pueblo has been done in such a way that uh, the bird count, it's uh, 214 species uh, validated by Cornell and the sorts. And uh, butterflies, 110 species, and ferns, uh, 98 species, uh, all within the city limits. So it's an example that um, human intervention can actually restore what uh, human degradation uh, meant. Uh, and what are we doing to, to replicate this? Uh, first, in a large, uh, in, 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 in a particular scope uh, with the municipality of the city of uh, Machu Picchu, we have uh, signed uh, an agreement uh, and uh, with uh, AGE, again, uh, we are working, uh, the beverage group, we are working on uh, uh, sanitation, on garbage. We are truly working on uh, uh, avoiding trash as a producer of carbon and methane. Uh, with um, a green initiative, uh, we do the metrics. It's important uh, to know what uh, our impact uh, uh, not only of uh, us as a company, but uh, of uh, all the companies involved in the area, all the human presence. Uh, so it's a question of uh, measuring the initial quantity of uh, carbon and then uh, on uh, monitoring it uh, so that uh, we can uh, have uh, a sense of uh, reality. With uh, another example, Jeremy, is with the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, we are working at uh, Madre de Dios, which is a southeastern Peru Amazonian area, to restore what uh, human presence uh, has uh, damaged uh, in a territorial quantity, space. It's, it's big. Uh, the genetic flow has been interrupted. So the creation of, uh, of uh, species Evolution has been stopped because of uh, man, man's uh, presence. So we are working on that, uh, on uh, the territorial restoration along the Madre de Dios River, which is a very difficult, uh, large uh, project. And uh, Erica mentioned uh, ocean preservation with Smithsonian as well. 
we are working on the preservation or the restoration of one of the iconic uh, uh, fishing places in the world, the, the Cabo Blanco, which uh, in the 50s, uh, it uh, the largest ever uh, sport fishing happened with uh, a black marlin, 1,560 pounds, which is the world record uh, overall since then. In uh, 57, the, the current record for tuna, uh, tuna fishing, sport fishing happened there as well. So we are working on, uh, on the ocean knowledge, understanding, research, and restoration. So Erica, let's uh, get together and try to do something about uh, this mm -hmm. uh, particular piece of land or ocean in Peru. And uh, as such, uh, Jeremy, we are involved in, uh, in different projects. Uh, how we make money through tourism. So the example is that uh, tourism has a truly a positive impact whenever you dare confront your reality. So let, let's work on it. It's uh, you're bringing us all together, Jeremy and the group, uh, helps uh, to share experiences and to look upon the future with action, which is what uh, you propose. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Joe. A lot to learn from one another and a lot to learn from what you're doing there in Machu Picchu in, in Peru. And you had a, got uh, a chance to talk a bit about uh, regeneration, which is happens to be our third pathway. So good segue as well. Um, Delphine, I know you'll be excited to, to talk about this, um, this particular pathway. Uh, regeneration pathway talks about restoring and protecting ecosystems, supporting nature's ability to draw down carbon and safeguard biodiversity. Let's tell us a little bit about the long run and, and your efforts to contribute to regenerative activities such as these. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I think as you've introduced us, we're, we can be defined as a, as a global community uh, of a global network of privately protected areas underpinned by tourism. And so all our members are dedicating to protecting, restoring ecosystems, using tourism as a vehicle for that. Call, and, and um, you know, our core mandate is learn from these models, showcase these models, cross-pollinate, cross -pollinate, accelerate learning. So collaboration is really at the heart of what we're doing uh, in terms of extending, extending um, uh, protection, conservation, restoration of, of ecosystems. Um, and also, um, you know, one of our role is really to inspire others uh, to, to get, it, you know, to invest in, in restoration and conservation and to use tourism as a, a nature-based solution, really. Together, our members protect already 24 million acres of, of nature. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it goes from restoration of wetlands in New Zealand to reforestation projects in Kenya to protection and cons conservation of rangelands, coral reefs, seagrass spanning all continents. So it's a, it's, a broad, it's a broad community and the idea is really to demonstrate how, how you can use tourism and, you know, potentially other land use as as vehicle to restore and conserve in all different contexts. Um, I feel at the core of our efforts, uh, you know, beyond that just hard uh, conservation work that our members do is really, uh, uh, and, and to ensure that we nurture nature's capacity to reduce carbon and help climate resilience for the long term, um, is promoting a holistic framework uh, for balance. So we, we, our members commit to adopt a holistic approach to their, to their work and to their business, which is framed around four C's of conservation, community, culture, and commerce. And as long, as long runners, we support them. Um, and, and what they commit to is really minimize their negative impacts and maximize their positive impacts in these four, in these four aspects. And what does that mean? It means that when they protect and preserve and conserve and all their you know, passionate conservation work, um, they also act as hubs for change. So it's not about only their properties, it's about what's happening outside 
Uh, it's demonstrating and sharing best practice, it's sharing knowledge, it's working and empowering communities and other stakeholders to transition from uh, or transition to more sustainable resource use, engage in greener economies. So, you know, examples can be uh, vocational training on, uh, on engaging in sustainable tourism economy in Indonesia to uh, shifting um, uh, agriculture and fishing practices to more sustainable ones, to engaging in, uh, um, you know, eco-sensitive uh, enterprise. Uh, so it spans, you know, different members, different, <laughs> different continents, different contexts, um, different needs. Um, addressed in different ways, but the important thing is is engaging as, as drivers for change and and hubs for change in in their landscape. Some of our members have been huge um, key in shifting the economy of their landscape from more you know from extractive to more nurturing through tourism, demonstrating the value of tourism as as a as a livelihood and an economic tool to to adopt more conservation based practices, and this has been particularly in the Pantanal and in Fine Bos. Uh, finally, we'll help our members to deliver transformative experience. So we believe tourism obviously has this huge potential to exponentially uh, increase the movement uh, for regeneration. So the idea is, is really design experiences that enable that emotional connection between guests, guests nature and people, raise interest and understanding and hopefully the desire to engage in a regenerative pathway uh, for the long term. So that's in a nutshell what, what we do. And I think the 4Cs framework is at, at the core. Um, you know, talking about measurements, obviously we, we encourage our members uh, to, to continuously improve. And for that, we help them with measurements and we have a standard uh, to help benchmark their progress and the balance between the 4Cs. Uh, and more recently to inform their climate actions, which is often not necessarily articulated, the, the huge contribution of protected areas in, in reducing carbon and, um, and increasing uh, resilience of uh, ecosystem, the planet and us. Uh, to change. Um, we're really helping them with tool to, to estimate their net climate impact. So looking at a carbon emission sure, but how much they contribute to, to sink carbon through the protection work that they're doing. Great, thank you, Delphine. So much to be inspired about, uh, inspired by <laughs> from your talk. Um, and I love that you basically alluded to, I, I think, nearly every pathway um, in your in your little presentation. So well done and weaving all those in. But it just goes to show how interconnected the, the pathways really are. Um, you know, even though we've we've separated them into, you know, very sort of very specific descriptions and activities, they, they obviously all build on one another and all build on th this concept that you also brought up that, you know, again, we believe that tourism um, can and should be um, a big part of the solution and that we should involve, um, you know, uh, we should involve visitors and, and travelers in that experience as the, as the industry recovers. So thank you so much for um, that really interesting presentation, Delphine. I really appreciate it. Um, Christine, it's over to you for Collaborate. Um, so this pathway encourages everyone in our sector to quite simply work together um, in, a, in a coordinated way towards achieving uh, our global targets. But it also particularly focuses on the role of associations in the ecosystem. And CHTA, the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association, is, is an association which focuses on strengthening capacity of its members and other stakeholders in the region, in particular, um, small and medium-sized enterprises, um, which are specifically called out in the declaration as well as an audience that needs, um, needs support and collaboration in order to achieve um, you know, their part uh, you know, and play their role in the uh, um, in this global effort. So can you talk to us just a little bit about your existing efforts or, or any future plans to address this um, pathway? All right, uh, and Jeremy, thanks for that. Uh, I know this is one of your favorite pathways, also mine. Um, I, will start with, uh, I will start with a motto from Henry Ford, which says, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, working together is success. So that really embodies the, the whole idea of collaboration. So the region has demonstrated success through the role of the Caribbean uh, when we had the Paris Agreement in December 2020. 
So the voice of the Caribbean, which was collaborative, has served to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change, where we saw more than 20 of the region's countries come together to agree and collaborate on our Caribbean position. There was also a groundswell of support for many others in the region, including CHTA, which formalized its support in writing and also publicly. So collaboration is really at the heart of CHT and it is embedded in everything that we do, right? Collaborations, as I mentioned before, should be regional, which is uh, within and amongst our Caribbean countries and other countries, as well as local. So we would include the government, the private sector, the nonprofit sectors, communities, small and medium uh, enterprises, uh, suppliers, guests, and also our valued employees, right? So definitely that goes along with the whole idea of the collaborative approach. So some of the things that CAST has been involved in, uh, which is that we have conducted training in the past with national hotel associations on environmental management systems, some of which would include uh, climate change information as well. Uh, the members of CAST also have access to environmental toolkits on our website. So I know for sure we have one, for example, on energy, one on waste. We have those toolkits available on our website. Uh, two years ago, CHT entered into a formal relationship with the Nature Conservancy through a grant facilitated by UNAP on coral reef restoration and protective protection of mangroves, which actually ties into some of the other pathways as well, regeneration. Uh, we had the Chinat project, uh, which focused on energy conservation, and this was a collaboration between the IDB, CHTA, CAST, and also the CTO. Uh, the project included over 200 full hotel audits and walkthroughs, hotel assessments for small and medium-sized hotels. That was the main target, primarily in the countries of Barbados, Jamaica, and the Bahamas. Additional audit, audits were also conducted on some of the other islands. Uh, and this project uh, obviously had to be in collaboration with the National Hotel and Tourism Associations. We've also built strategic partnerships with several boards and ministries of tourism across the region, such as the U.S. Virgin Island uh, Department of Tourism for that for the last four years. So that is ongoing. Uh, our partnership with CAFA as well, which is the Caribbean Public Health Authority, uh, is noteworthy to mention as well in terms of health surveillance within the region. And of course, we know that, you know, our climate change also has uh, health health effects. Right. So six of uh, the collaborations with them put us in a better place. Uh, six years, sorry, of collaboration with uh, CAFA put us in a better place to respond now to the COVID pandemic. CHG also has a federation of 32 national hotel and tourism associations, which provides a uh, regional, which is a local support, and also su uh, supports local collaborations between the private and the public sector. Regular communication is maintained within these organizations. We're also working currently with CARICOM on the recovery of the sector. So definitely collaboration, as I mentioned, is at the heart of what we do. Now, I know we're also looking forward to having a, a way forward. So the way forward is capacity building uh, continued through educational awareness on climate change issues affecting the region and also ensuring that each organization has climate change top of mind on the agenda as well as embedded in their policies. And that's one of the things I love about the, about the declaration that it commits us to not only just uh, mention it, but also to have it embedded in our policies. Quite a number of uh, hotels and tourism organizations, we have policies, but we also want to include that climate change messaging. And as Shannon mentioned, you know, we just don't want it to be high level rhetoric. We want it to be actual practical things that are uh, taking place at the ground level. So moving forward as well, another word, uh, Alongside collaboration, we also want to see quite a bit of coordination within the region, persons not working in silos, but each of us sort of leveraging the resources that we have. I know one of the resources that uh, the CHTA has is that we have quite a large reach. We have been able to agitate quite a significant amount of change uh, within the region as pertains to climate change and environmental issues. However, of course, if we have additional support, and of course, if we collaborate some more, we would definitely have much more of a, of a, of a bigger impact within the region. And that's about it. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Christine. I, I suppose as a, um, 
a member of the drafting committee, it's probably not right that I have a favorite pathway. I should love them all <laughs> the same, but um, it was really important actually. And you know, I'm, I'm also here representing civil society, um, working closely with a lot of associations, member-based organizations. And we really wanted to, you know, in addition to have, you know, an integrated pathway for, for everyone, we really wanted to make sure that we thought we um, highlighted the importance of every organization within the ecosystem and associations um, obviously playing a, a critical role in education, in advocacy, in holding the bar high for members and in providing that capacity building role. It's going to be critical for us to achieve these, um, these global targets and, and, uh, and, and, and really in finding ways to work together to, um, to deliver on the, um, the ambition of the declaration. So thank you so much, Christine. We are at our final speaker and then I'll just wrap up with a few um, closing notes and a little call to action. So Erica, it's over to you um, for our final pathway, which is finance. I'm really glad we have Erica answering this question. Um, this pathway describes the need to ensure that organizational resources are appropriately allocated towards achieving climate action objectives and, and even further in implementing necessary policies. So the Oregon Coast Visitors Association is a pretty small DMO uh, without a tremendous amount of resources yet um, has taken already a globally leading role on climate action. So I wanna know, Erica, how are you creatively addressing this in your early efforts um, in terms of resource allocation and just any thoughts you might have about how to ensure that appropriate resources will be available in future years to deliver on the plans and ambitions that you're developing there on the Oregon Coast. Yeah, well, I'm surprised this is not your favorite uh, measurement here, Jeremy, because it's so easy to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> They're all my favorites. Uh, I, I admit. Of course, you know, talking about finance, this is going to look different for every single person on the call because we're all funded so differently. But I hope that um, some of my key findings that we have discovered in the past five months that we've worked on this will um, possibly, you know, inspire you and encourage you to look at these creative solutions um, and not feel like the, the lack of finance that you may have um, will restrict you from doing this type of work. So the first thing in our goal in setting out with, with this is that we are a small organization and our whole team was like, let's not reinvent the wheel if we don't have to. And so I'm really glad that Shannon started off by talking about these different you know, carbon calculators. The technology actually is changing daily. Since the, in five months, the technology has changed greatly. So we've been looking at other resources and there are these new calculators coming online that are more appropriate for the work that we're doing. Uh, additionally, we're very lucky in, in the state of Oregon that we have all of our agencies, state government agencies, are mandated to have their own climate action plan. So again, we're looking at all the resources. What is our state transportation agency doing and how can we tap into that? What is our business organization doing? How can we support them with that? Um, because again, we don't want to start something totally new, reinvent the wheel, and then possibly make solutions more confusing for our stakeholders. Um, secondly, another creative way that we're starting to look at this is as a destination management organization, we have several different departments, um, one of them being destination development. So we have our team that works on creating the infrastructure that keeps visitors in our destination longer. That's things like mountain biking trails, hiking trails, the ability to get on the water and kayak or canoe. Um, so what does it look like if instead of creating a, a completely new department to start with, if our destination development team also starts working on electric vehicle chargers, um, if they start also working on infrastructure that would keep the sustainably minded visitors here longer as well. Of course, we have a marketing department that tells the stories of our businesses and our communities, our cultural heritage. Um, you know, what does it look like if our marketing is also highlighting these businesses that are using locally sourced food that are, are very conscious of their supply chain of scope three, um, you know, again, just looking at how we can align climate action with our existing departments, rather than being overwhelmed with the idea of hiring on an entirely new staff with funding that we possibly don't have. Um, so we're really excited to see how we can just incorporate climate action in each of our staff members roles and our departments and with the people that we're working with. Another key finding that we've had is just there are so many co-benefits of climate action with, with other types of strategies going on. So um, there's a lot of funding for natural disaster mitigation, and that would also address some of our climate action goals. Uh, we work on a lot of destination management issues like over tourism, um, you know, 
traffic congestion, parking, a lot of the solutions for destination management are also some of the solutions for climate action. So we're really starting to look at the co-benefits. Um, unfortunately, when I Google, is there funding for Oregon Coast Tourism and Climate Action? I'm not getting a lot of results. <laughs> but when I do Google and talk about destination management um, funding or natural disaster funding, economic recovery funding, we are starting to see a lot. So really is looking outside of the box um, to see what funding exists and, and what's coming down the line. That, that's one, one answer there, Jeremy. Great. We're going to come back next year and, and um, explore how that budget has expanded and um, how you've continued to creatively finance your, your ambitions. So thanks so much, Eric. I appreciate it. All right. We have wrapped up our program for today. So I just want to finish with some final notes for everyone, um, mostly uh, logistical uh, in nature. Um, so first of all, the signatory form um, for those of us who are interested in becoming a signatory to the global to the Glasgow Declaration, um, which I hope is all of you, um, will become available in the One Planet website um, for those who are interested. So the text is already there, and the form to sign on will be ready very shortly. Um, we will certainly alert everyone um, as soon as it's ready. Um, we are also planning to add a recommended actions table on the website. And the goal of this is to, to guide signatories in the development of their plans. Those recommended actions are organized um, according to the pathways and um, we will be um, open um, to additional recommended actions that anyone would like to um, submit for review. Um, so look for that resource to come and to grow over time. And we plan over time to use this as a hub for climate action to add additional tools and resources over time. Um, there will be a reporting process. It will take place through the One Planet platform. Um, I will say just transparently, the reporting template is not finalized. Um, we would prefer to define the reporting process transparently um, through a consultative process with signatories. Um, so that is some that is work that will continue and that will hopefully involve many of you in the coming months. We didn't want to pres prescribe a reporting process that wouldn't necessarily work for everyone and have to unwind it later. Um, so this will be another consultative process that we're in engaging in to make sure that this declaration and the follow-up actions work for everybody. So thank you very much for joining today. It's really been an honor um, to be here together. And I want to thank the, the panelists for bringing lots of ideas and, and inspiration to our um, discussion today. I'm looking forward to working together with all of you to make significant progress as a united sector towards the Glasgow Declaration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank all the you. best to you all. Thank you. Thank you.